Okay, yes. Wow, just amazing conference. Uh, all the talks, just really so forefront and uh, uh, absolutely at the cutting edge. Uh, and I think now, 2022, is an exciting time to be a member of our society. Things are happening around the world that reflect uh, movement in the direction of the pioneering vision of this society. Thought leaders are more and more appreciating that having kept the fundamentality of consciousness banished outside of the mainstream has led to tragic situations across multiple areas of science, education, and culture, and that it, it is time for change. Uh, our member, Stephanie Schwartz, he insightfully traces that problematic banishment to the Council of Trent in the 1550s, at least uh, in, the, you know, in the West. And uh, he, uh, check out his talk at the Nimhans Conference uh, in September of this year. Uh, it's online. So I see our society as undoing the Council of Trent and re-welcoming consciousness back to the center of our existence and therefore re-enchanting the world. So in this talk, I want to say a little bit about how, but it's really going to be <laughs> my perspective on how. And uh, a big part of me is in the camp of uh, what Bill Benkskin just said a few times. Uh, we really don't know much at all. But let me go forth anyway. Let's see. Now the PowerPoint is not uh, advancing. Yeah, I don't see it either. Uh, if you want, you could email it to me. I could try to do it. Yeah, my, my screen is frozen again. That's what the problem is. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, you can see the you can see the PowerPoint, right? Yep, can see uh, can see PowerPoint the program. Yeah, Not, I think me. I think uh, I'll just go through this way uh, okay. to avoid more problems. If that's all right. Sure. So, tracing the history of the, the Tucson Science of Consciousness conferences, for example, uh, uh, when 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 those conferences started the sort of consensus view there was uh, quantum effects were believed not possible in the brain. Uh, classical physicalist models uh, that ep consciousness is epiphenomenal were considered kind of the only scientific uh, approaches. And the cause of closure of the physical aspect of reality was generally accepted. Now it's quite different. Quantum effects are of many types. They're known throughout biology and the brain and, uh, you know, magnetic field sensors in birds and photosynthesis, uh, Hameroff Penrose microtubules models has been kind of shored up and uh, uh, laser measures of quantum entanglement in brain tissues, <clears throat> et cetera. Uh, and and uh, quantum physics is now uh, consensusly uh, thought to, known to be necessarily related to consciousness. And if conscious physical agency happens, it involves quantum collapse. Uh, uh, and right and now, almost everybody's a panpsychist, or uh, 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 very many people are, are respectively panpsychist or pan, pan experientialist. And especially importantly, the causal closure of the physical is being the notion that the physical universe is causally closed is being relinquished. Uh, so, now, the Society for Consciousness Studies perspective is starting to become recognized as forefront and uh, as the cutting edge. And uh, uh, we're joining forces with the founders of the uh, Tucson conferences. For example, uh, Stuart Hameroff is going to be affiliating with CHS. He's, he's going to continue uh, running the Tucson conferences through the University of Arizona Tucson, but partially retiring from there. and, and uh, partially affiliating with CIHS as well, which we're very excited about. So 
the pigs don't fly anti-consciousness dogma that uh, Arnold DeLorme mentioned yesterday doesn't fly anymore on this view. Uh, so I think we're at a tremendous moment in history. I think we're seeing, we're in the process of seeing a transcending of the dogma of scientific materialism. Uh, why, why is that happening? Well, there is the evidence from parapsychology, anomalous cognition, healing. Uh, there are definitive laboratory demonstrations of non-local quantum effects in basic physics. This year's 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was for those, for those physics experiments. Uh, there are numerous, numerous demonstrations of quantum effects in biology, including the brain. And there's a growing realization that ontology of consciousness is the most important unsolved problem in science today, and that radically new approaches are needed to address it. And I think there's a growing ability to see how this is an evolution through modern science. It's not a repudiation of modern science. And I think that growing ability helps this process, this revolution that we're seeing happening, uh, happen. Uh, Rudolf Steiner identified the dogma of scientific materialism as being one of the four major barriers to progress in the 20, 21st century. And so th this is a historical thing if it is being transcended. And it probably also involves a, uh, a pre-trans movement, uh, to use uh, Ken Wilber terminology, uh, spiral dynamics, um, uh, that the, uh, the, the uh, scientific materialism paradigm operates largely at the rational stage and uh, just can't see that there are uh, transrational stages of, of, of operation. And so it reduces all, uh, all, all non-materialist non approaches to uh, pre-rational, whereas they can also be uh, transrational. So I see as a metaphor uh, what's going on today in, in the science of consciousness and, and uh, uh, consciousness studies as uh, uh, these breakthroughs in the ontology of consciousness sort of akin to the planetary encounters that we had with the uh, NASA Voyager spacecraft. Uh, when, when uh, so Voyager 2 was the first spacecraft to go by all the outer planets. And I had the privilege to work on one of the instrument teams uh, of Voyager 2 and, and they were called planetary encounters when Voyager 2 uh, went close by uh, uh, another planet for the first time. And every, every time uh, the pattern was, you know, we know the planets that as uh, points of light or maybe a little bit of detail from telescopes from Earth. Uh, uh, and there was all sorts of speculation sent by, among scientists, uh, like maybe it has clouds or something like that, or no, it's too cold, nothing's gonna be happening there. And then, then the spacecraft gets there and uh, you just see all sorts of amazing uh, phenomena happening that weren't imagined uh, before you got there and, and looked at it. So in, at the Nimhans conference in Bangalore in September, uh, I was part of the entertainment as uh, the opening debate, they called the man-machine debate. And we were talking about uh, AI, the idea AI, can, can AI become conscious, general AI, and uh, will, will it take over the world? and that kind of thing. And I discussed the, uh, how in March of 2016, AlphaGo crushed the best human Go player, the best human Go player. And that was quite a while after uh, 1997, when IBM's Deep Blue, Deep Blue computer uh, beat uh, Gary Kasparov, the best human chess player. And those of us who have played chess and Go as a hobby, uh, we were hoping that, uh, well, maybe Go is so complex, it involves intuition, human intuition, computers will never beat the, hum the best human Go players. But, but then uh, AlphaGo did a lot faster than a lot of people thought. And it did it through machine learning, neural networks, uh, and AlphaGo learned from, from uh, playing humans and playing itself. 
and playing other computers. Uh, and it learned how, how to play better than any, any human. And now AlphaGo, uh, he, he, the best human professional Go players, they learn from AlphaGo and the computers that AlphaGo has taught whole new categories of ways to play Go that you know, probably would have taken thousands of years for humans alone to develop, uh, uh, or maybe humans never would have developed. So in this very limited domain of game playing, uh, computers are already uh, domain smart, uh, transhuman in a sense, beyond humans. And they've already, uh, if, you, if, you, if you define their constrained a Turing test just to the game of Go, computers have already uh, passed it, passed, uh, passed that test. Um, but on, is AlphaGo conscious? Uh, so approaching that question from uh, sort of a, a Vedic ontology of consciousness view, this was a talk in India, uh, 1893, and also the East and the West, uh, 1893, uh, Swami Vivekananda, he was the first you know, big uh, Indian Swami to come to the United States and speak in, in the West at the 1893 World Parliament of Religions in Chicago. And he was talking about Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, where the model is you have the Atman, the soul, you know, the, the universal soul. And uh, then you have the separate uh, space-time mind consciousness uh, uh, little souls and uh, body brain action is Maya, and that's the world of science. Uh, but in 1899, in, in the 1890s, uh, the pre modern physics of the time, classical physics, uh, on that view, uh, the world of science just cannot be causally connected to the world of consciousness, uh, souls, and the universal soul. Uh, but in modern physics, modern physics creates an opening in the causal structure of the physical universe that allows for a reunification with Vedic ontology and uh, other, other ancient, uh, ancient ontologies of how reality works in including consciousness. So this opening in, uh, in uh, modern physics uh, provides a possible route forward to a reunification, not a return only to the pre-modern views, but, but a route forward to a re reunification. Uh, but this operates necessarily beyond uh, space-time locality. Um, and, uh, but Vedic ontology just doesn't work in pre-modern classical physics. It does work. In, uh, in modern quantum physics, possibly. So, AlphaGo on this view uh, uh, is not conscious because it's classical computing. It's classical computing artificial intelligence. And uh, on this approach, it's, it's only through the opening of quantum physics, uh, uh, collapse of the wave function, that you can have uh, conscious agency involved in the physical world. And so uh, only on this view, uh, uh, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, might eventually possibly become conscious. Uh, but yesterday, Ben Gertzel, he addressed that uh, view and said, well, maybe the uh, the uh, quantum uh, collapse is actually happening in, in the observer. And so you could have classical computing AI uh, possibly be uh, sort of conscious in that way. I'm not sure I understand that view, but anyhow, we, we uh, don't know much about that. So I'm calling uh, this approach actual theory, being a, a, a meta-ontology of approaches to the hard problem of consciousness, which is qualia or the experience of being and, and the conscious causation problem, which is also the free will problem.
So just just really quickly, a little bit of my own uh, uh, motivation for this. Uh, uh, since I, well, I was a kid, I, I had anomalous cognition experiences that 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 seem that were told by the culture around me not to be possible possible because of the scientific materialist view of reality. So uh, so I decided to go into physics to see if that was really true and also uh, do meditation and esoteric spiritual practices. And along the way, I realized that even ordinary consciousness uh, still needs to be explained before we try to uh, try to explain anomalous consciousness. So that's sort of the trajectory of my, my, my personal uh, motivation for this study. And then the scientific motivation, I think, is that the central unsolved scientific problem of our time really is the ontology of consciousness. And, and uh, the mind-body problem, what is the relationship between consciousness and physical processes? Uh, uh, and it's also part of uh, Hiroshi Motoyama's mission for California Institute for Human Science uh, uh, as well. It's, it's part of the uh, eight principles that he developed to, to, uh, to guide uh, how CHS should operate. And uh, in his wonderful book, uh, Being in the Logic of Indirective Function, he describes a whole approach as well that connects with uh, basically Advaita Vedanta uh, uh, in, 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 and with uh, experiential uh, uh, developmental practices and the, some of the, the key statements that he comes up with through experience uh, sound a lot like uh, the uh, 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 Bohr Heisenberg uh, description of Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. So, I, I, I consider actual theory as a foundation for for going beyond the metaphor and uh, developing an actual theory for uh, what's going on. And we finally have an opening to be able to do that. Uh, so, you know, the physicalist claim is the physical universe must be causally closed. Therefore, cannot, consciousness cannot have causal agency. But that's not true. You know, it's only the classical physical universe that, that had to be causally closed and deterministic. Uh, quantum mechanics, uh, the, the quantum physics universe ha has this opening in it. And that opening is wonderfully described by Rosenblum and Kuttner in their book, The Quantum Enigma. That was referenced uh, yesterday, I think, by Dean Radin as well. Um, and, and recently, Johannes Kleiner has actually made a proof that that is through. It's only through the the uh, the uh, collapse of the wave function that uh, there could be uh, causal agency of consciousness in in the physical world. Uh, just you know, the textbook quantum mechanics. Uh, a quantum physical system evolves according to two processes: the, the determin deterministic shorting equation. Uh, until a measurement or collapse occurs uh, to uh, one uh, particular uh, uh, outcome of the probability distribution, which is the only thing that the Schrodinger equation uh, evolves through time is the probability distribution of what you're going to observe when you do observe. Uh, um, and that's a non-deterministic, non-algorithmic process, or as Roger Penrose calls it, non-computational process. And Penrose uh, uh, has done a lot of work uh, describing how uh, it's only through necessarily non-computational processes that, uh, on his view, consciousness can operate in, in the world. So, uh, also, the you know, quantum mechanics uh, being applied to distribution, probability distributions, or it, or it only gives you probability distributions, the Schrodinger equation does. And so uh, it really only applies to uh, uh, statistical ensembles of identical physical systems. Uh, but the, the real world may actually be a, uh, a sequence of unique events, uh, and which quantum mechanics uh, doesn't say anything about in the, in the sense that uh, the particular outcome of the, uh, the collapse uh, is just not a part of physics. And uh, uh, Hameroff and Penrose have built up an impressive 
model of structurally how one possible way that this could work through microtubules. And uh, this is a, these are uh, chart, uh, graphs from uh, uh, Stuart Hamroff's, one of his recent papers. Uh, and he's, he's, they're able to sketch now on this model, the whole sequence of scales, scales and frequency, and also scales and size, uh, all the way down to the tiny, tiny and very short time uh, uh, on their model, orchestrated objective reduction, the, to the uh, uh, collapse of the wave function uh, through uh, uh, Penrose uh, quantum gravity. And then here on the, on the right is uh, Roger Penrose's uh, model from, uh, from his book, uh, uh, Shadows of the Mind, 1994 book, Shadows of the Mind, where he sketches three worlds of reality, the physical world, the mental world, the platonic world. And so the, the whole Hammeroff Penrose model so far, it pretty much is only about the physical world part of that model and how it can uh, set up a connection with moments of consciousness. Uh, so Penrose's book, Shadows of the Mind, the whole first part of it is about that uh, uh, third arrow to the Platonic world from the mental world. And uh, if I, I recommend reading that book, uh, but going straight to part two, which is to me much more accessible and it's about this model. Uh, and and at the at the end he he has these this uh, actual three domains uh, uh, chart up there, and so it's clearly a route to transcending or moving beyond the uh, the materialist uh, dogma. And I think it's a really good route. It's kind of he, he's kind of complicated to understand what he's doing there, but I uh, I think it's a really good route. Uh, and even David Chalmers recently, the, the co-founder of the Tucson Conferences, he's talking about uh, uh, property dualism through quantum collapse models. Uh, Chalmers, uh, he's got a nice video out and a paper where uh, on, uh, he sets it up well. He says, well, you have, the, you have two options. You have either materialism or dualism. He doesn't mention idealism as the other option, but... Uh, he said, on that view, you really only have two options, materialism or dualism, where and in dualism, where uh, uh, everything is, is physical or mental and mind is non-physical, or at least some kind of mind-like aspect of reality is non-physical. Uh, uh, and then you have substance dualism or property dualism. And so um, I'm going to get back to that in a second. I think this is a really wonderful review article recently by... And, uh, and two of these authors uh, spoke at our conference this weekend. Uh, this is a really wonderful, excellent review article, very recently published in September uh, uh, about the limitations of materialist models, and that, uh, that consciousness is epiphenomenal, and uh, the advantages of non-materialist models, uh, that consciousness is fundamental. Um, the only, I think uh, the only problems there are problems of nuance with uh, that paper uh, uh, that one, uh, it, it doesn't take head on the, uh, the assumption of causal closure of the physical universe, which we can now. And uh, it, it says uh, non-materialist models require consciousness as primary to all else. I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, I, I think that might be a kind of a hangover from the sway that materialism had, uh, that the only option to it seemed to be dualism, there seemed to be idealism, but I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, so taking that model that uh, uh, quantum collapse approaches uh, to uh, property dualism, basically, further, uh, uh, you have the, the fundamental properties of science are governed by fundamental laws of reality, quantum mechanics, relativity theory, etc. An example is James Crook Maxwell introduced uh, charge as a fundamental property that uh, governed by the uh, Maxwell's laws of electromagnetics and electrodynamics. And uh, that was a, an example of an introduction of a new property to uh, fundamental science. So we're going to go forward. 
Uh, so I'm generalizing uh, that Chalmers McQueen approach. And so what's the history of introducing new properties, fundamental new properties? Well, you had Newton's laws of classical mechanics, approximately 1687. He introduced the property of universal gravitational mass that's acted on the force of gravity, acted on by the force of gravity. And uh, uh, Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics, 1862, introduced the property of electric charge that's acted on by the electromagnetic force. Uh, then, then you had the discovery of quantum mechanics in about 1925 that uh, introduced the wave nature of matter. That's not really a new property, um, but it's a whole new thing. And then uh, on the standard model, there was the introduction of the new property of flavor that's acted on by the weak nuclear force in the 1970s, and the new property of color charge that's acted on by the strong nuclear force in the 1970s. So now in, in 2022, why can't we introduce a new property of, we could call it something like noetic charge. Noetic charge, that we, it could be a ontic property of matter, ontic meaning an ontological property of matter that instantiates the experience of being. But it's not involved in any forces, no new forces of physics, but it is involved in the uh, collapse process. So on this view, you might have noetic fields. Uh, so it's noetic field, actual theory, uh, noetic charges that generate noetic fields. And uh, uh, noetic fields are an ontic field that surrounds or is generated by noetically charged particles and generates mind-like processes. Uh, and then you, you could have noetic action, noetic field induced, noetic field influenced collapse processes. Uh, in, in, the, in the measurement process uh, of uh, knowledge of the system um, that also influence, influences the result, but remains consistent uh, with what's thought of as the Born rule, which is the probability uh, uh, interpretation of the, uh, of the uh, Schrodinger wave function. So in addition to generating experience and conscious causation, possible noetic field generated systems, they may include the platonic ideals that, uh, that uh, Penrose was talking about. And uh, uh, things like the acupuncture qi meridian system of traditional Chinese medicine, influencing the biological functioning of the organs of the body. And the chakranadi system, system of uh, traditional Indian Ay Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, even maybe systems of devic entities and nature spirits like Theosophy talks about. And then you could make sense of paintings like this Alex Gray model of a uh, human being where you have the physical body and the mechanical chemical systems, but then you also have non-physical bodies, consciousness like noetic fields. So, um, Many have warned about how strange or amazing or wonderful, depending on your view, this type of actual theory, theory will be. Uh, uh, Bell, who, who gave us Bell's theorem, uh, uh, he said the new way of seeing things will involve an imaginative leap that will astonish us. And then Henry Stapp, who works on uh, quantum-based models of consciousness, uh, he's a physicist, uh, he said uh, Bell's theorem is the most profound theorem of all, in all of science, all of science, not just all of physics or all of consciousness. And uh, Anton Zeilinger, I've been quoting him for years uh, uh, as follows. Uh, this new theory will be so much stranger than current quantum mechanics that people attacking quantum mechanics now will long to have it back. So I've been quoting Zeilinger for years. And this year, they gave Zeilinger the Nobel Prize for demonstrating uh, non-local effects in, in uh, fundamental basic uh, uh, physics experiments. Uh, three people got the Nobel Prize for that this year, and Bell certainly would have gotten it if he were still alive as well. So that's the conclusion. And now, back to thank you for this amazing conference. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your production of this conference.
and uh, our society, uh, our society leadership, Elizabeth Krasnoff, secretary and membership coordinator, and Charles Silverstein, who I think is with us in this conference uh, this weekend, uh, treasurer, and Leslie Allen Combs, the founder and first president of the Society for Consciousness Studies. And remember from our uh, charter, what we say we do at the Society for Consciousness Studies, uh, it ends in a preference for new paradigmatic approaches. The society provides a safe and brave space for researchers to share cutting edge theories and findings. And I think this weekend's conference has really demonstrated that amazingly uh, greatly. So thank you so much. Happy winter solstice. I think winter solstice is perfect time for our society conference, the rebirth of the uh, enlightened new year.